We know that with their Starship Super Heavy Vehicle, SpaceX has made a rocket unlike anything we have seen before. And in order to make Starship possible, SpaceX has also had to design and build a launch pad unlike anything we have seen before. The Starbase launch site is an engineering marvel on par with the giant rocket that lifts off from it. A genuine first principles approach to getting the world's most powerful flying machine off the ground and on its way to outer space, the moon, Mars, and beyond. This is how SpaceX reinvented the launch pad. Let's quickly touch on what a traditional rocket launch pad looks like so that we can identify the areas where SpaceX has diverted with their new Starbase design. Let's use the Falcon 9 as our primary example of a traditional rocket launch procedure. So the first thing that they're going to do is wheel the fully integrated rocket out of the assembly building. This has everything loaded up and ready for flight. It's going to be transported horizontally to the launch pad, where the rocket is then offloaded onto the launch tower. Once the rocket is attached to the tower, a mechanism is going to slowly lift the rig into a vertical launch position. Once the rocket is set in position, umbilical connections are routed into the first and second stage for propellant loading. Seconds before the launch, the water deluge system is going to activate and massive streams of water will get dumped under the base of the rocket. This is partially for a cooling effect, but more importantly, the water is going to absorb the powerful acoustic energy from the rocket engines, and then at engine ignition, all of the flame, exhaust gas, and steam from vaporizing water is going to get pushed below the surface of the launch pad into a trench. The angles of the concrete down there are going to divert all of this energy and matter out to the side, away from the rocket. Sounds pretty simple, and that's because it kinda is. The goal here is just to contain the energy and gas from the launch and move it as far away from the rocket as possible. This is the way that pretty much all rockets have been launched since the late 1950s. Not much has changed until now. The ground system responsible for launching the Starship is an incredibly complex collection of infrastructure. This launch complex is often referred to as Stage Zero, which is to imply that the ground infrastructure is just as much a part of the Starship rocket as the booster and the orbiter. For our purpose here, we are going to break Stage Zero up into the key components and then tackle each one individually. There are now four pillars to the Starship launch process, the tank farm, the flame diverter, the launch mount, and the launch tower. Each one serves a vital purpose in getting the Starship Super Heavy fully integrated, launch prepped, and into the air. The tank farm is pretty self-explanatory. It's a collection of large tanks that just sits a few meters away from the launch tower. The original idea here was to build Starship's external tanks in the same way that SpaceX built the internal tanks, by vertically stacking 9 meter diameter rings of stainless steel, maximum efficiency. And then because the tank farm needs to hold cryogenic liquid for long durations of time, each stainless steel stack was covered over by an insulating sheath. This ground system allows SpaceX to rapidly tank and detank the Starship and Super Heavy for everything from cryoproofing and static fire testing to full orbital launch. Again, if we are looking for efficiency, then we want to find the shortest path between two points, and it doesn't get much shorter than this. Many people said that SpaceX was crazy for placing these giant vertical standing tanks right next to the most powerful rocket ever made, and many people were correct on that one. SpaceX quickly realized that using vertical methane tanks was wildly unsafe, so those were long ago converted to the narrow horizontal cylinders that we see today. The remaining vertical tanks are used to hold liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, and water, but they will soon be replaced by horizontal tanks as well. We've seen the exterior shields of the tank farm battered and crumpled by the force of each Starship launch, even when they weren't getting chunks of concrete thrown at them. So, the tank farm is not moving any further away, but it will be redesigned to become a lot less prone to damage. Hey everyone, as we traverse through the cosmos of content, there's something stellar I've come across and I absolutely had to share it with you all. Introducing Novium's Hover Pen, a true embodiment of innovation and luxury. So what makes the Hover Pen so special? Well, award-winning design. 
The interstellar edition of the hover pen isn't just another writing tool, it was heralded as one of the best inventions of 2022 by time, a testament to its unique design and functionality. You can spin the hover pen on its base, and it feels like the pen is in a gravity-free space. It's truly the coolest pen for any space enthusiast. Stellar Inspiration Priced at $99, the Interstellar Edition beautifully captures the Earth's axis inclination at a 23.5 degree angle. The colors are simply out of this world, from the deep expanse of space black, the shimmer of starlight silver, the fiery Mars magma, to the serene Neptune blue. For those who crave exclusivity, there are the premium editions, the radiance of 18 karat gold plating, and even a version with an actual meteorite shard embedded. Future Edition Novium isn't stopping there. Their latest masterpiece, the Future Edition, priced at $149, is a two-in-one marvel. Fountain pen or roller bar, you get to choose with its interchangeable tip, and for those who value unparalleled luxury, there's a premium edition featuring an 18 solid karat gold nib. It's also a timeless gift, whether you're treating yourself or searching for that perfect gift for a loved one. Hover pens are more than just writing instruments. They are a blend of art and the mysteries of space, offering an unrivaled writing experience, and serving as a timeless piece of luxury. Now for the stars of my community, here's a celestial deal. Use code SPACERACE and grab a 10% discount along with free shipping on all hover pens. Dive into the cosmos of luxury and innovation by clicking the link below. I'm also eager to know which edition caught your eye and why. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Speaking of damage, we get to the most exciting innovation at Starbase, the brand new flame diverter system and blast surface. When it came time to build the launch pad at Starbase many years ago, SpaceX decided they were going to hold true to one of Elon's most famous mantras, the best part is no part. So therefore, instead of building the water deluge system and flame diverting trench that we saw earlier, SpaceX built none of those things. Did this make their launch pad better? No. But what it did do was buy SpaceX a lot more time to develop a better flame diverter system. The deal here is that Elon and crew were gambling that a reinforced concrete pad would be sturdy enough to get them through Starship development, suborbital testing, booster static fires, and even the first orbital launch attempt, but it was never meant to be a permanent solution. And Elon was mostly right. As usual, the concrete was good enough for everything right up until the moment of liftoff on April 20th, 2023, at which time the 30 functioning Raptor engines on Booster 7 throttled up and shattered the blast surface, which then allowed something like 12 million pounds of force to get under the ground and emerge spectacularly as a tornado of rock, dust, concrete, and twisted metal. As bad as that looked, SpaceX was already way ahead on developing the solution to the problem before it even happened. Enter the showerhead, a water-cooled steel sandwich that functions as a flame diverter, shock absorber, and blast surface all in one. With the launch pad area now freshly excavated via rocket engines, SpaceX set to work on their ultimate solution. Seeing the full power of the Super Heavy booster in action was obviously a humbling experience, so no chances were taken with the construction of the new launch surface. The first thing engineers did was place nine four-foot diameter concrete rebar columns directly underneath the booster engines. They were planted 35 meters deep into the ground. These are called piles they are going to transfer the energy from the surface deep into the ground. Then around the immediate perimeter of the launch pad, there are another 12 secondary piles, and outside of that are 11 more tertiary piles. This will evenly distribute and dissipate the energy into the mass of the Earth. On top of the piles is another structure called the pile cap. This begins with a massive network of rebar. The mesh of steel is used to tie all of the vertical columns together, so the 32 piles and 6 legs of the launch mount are all brought together as one massive support system. On the top of the rebar structure, SpaceX welds steel integration plates that will be used to attach the shower head into the support system, and then they fill the pile cap with concrete. The base layer takes 132 mixer trucks and 11 hours to lay 1,000 cubic meters of concrete. This creates a slab 1.8 meters thick. On top of that goes another 850 cubic meters of material for an upper layer that's 2.2 meters thick. Next, SpaceX attaches their water supply manifolds into the pile cap. These will distribute high pressure water into the shower head. Water comes into the system through a pair of four foot diameter pipes. 
the bile cap is topped off with the steel sandwich. This is two plates of high strength steel between 1.5 and 2 inches thick. The top plate is perforated to create water jets, and in between the two are vertical steel beams with holes cut into them to allow water flow. Obviously, you're not going to get one continuous sheet of steel that size, so the core of the top plate is cut into a hexagon shape, and it's surrounded by trapezoid shapes on all sides. We can see from the operation of this system that the water isn't distributed equally across the plate. The flow is concentrated in the center and directly underneath each of the booster's engine nozzles. We can also see that the central water jets are firing outwards at a shallow angle of around 30 degrees, while the outer jets are pointed at a steeper angle of around 60 degrees. The point of this water flow is not to cancel out the downward momentum of the exhaust gas, but to simply help in quickly redirecting the gas outwards to release pressure. The water jets transfer their momentum into the exhaust plume, and the energy released by converting water into steam is going to help accelerate that exhaust away from the blast surface. The remaining water that is driven down to the surface of the plate will form an insulating layer of liquid and steam to absorb the thermal energy of the engine flame and keep the plate at a manageable temperature. Because there are so many holes in the top plate, it would be virtually impossible for steam to get trapped inside the shower head and therefore cause a pressure explosion. All of the energy hitting that steel plate is being transferred into the pile cap and distributed evenly down through the piles into the earth, so none of the concrete is going to crack and break. The water for the flame diverter is coming from a collection of seven horizontal water tanks that sit just behind the launch tower. The high pressure flow of water is created by injecting nitrogen gas into the top of the water and tank, forcing the liquid out through the bottom. SpaceX uses 76 nitrogen gas canisters that each contain somewhere between 3 and 6,000 psi of pressure. The combined volume of this water is 1.4 million liters, and that provides 8 seconds of maximum water flow, just enough time for Starship to throttle up and clear the launch mount. Let's move upwards from the blast surface to the orbital launch mount. This is yet another incredibly complex machine. When a super heavy booster is lowered onto the launch mount, the structure is held in place by a series of 20 clamps all around the circumference. These are mechanical units that can fold in and out as needed, and they are able to hold down the massive rocket for days at a time as tests and prep work is performed. Alongside each clamp is another mechanism that will connect and interface with each of the 20 outer ring engines on the booster. These are miniature quick disconnect arms that are used to spin start and ignite the outer ring of booster engines. This is essentially taking equipment out of the rocket and moving it into the launch mount, thereby making each booster cheaper and easier to manufacture. The orbital launch mount is absolutely loaded with an intricate network of plumbing that we can't even begin to properly explain here, but some other key functions of the ground system are pre-chilling the Raptor engines so that they don't experience thermal shock from the cryogenic propellant, and pressurizing the tanks that are hidden underneath the aerodynamic chines of the booster. There are pressurized nitrogen tanks for restarting the booster engines after stage separation, and pressurized CO2 tanks for fire suppression in the engine bay. Then on top of the launch mount is one singular umbilical arm that is responsible for sending liquid oxygen and liquid methane into the booster's tanks. At the moment of liftoff, all of these different connection systems will instantly retract from the booster and snap back behind plates of steel armor to protect them from the world's largest blowtorch as it ascends into the sky. Moving up again way up to the towering steel structure that is known around Starbase as the Mechazilla. At 145 meters in height, this is by far the most intense launch tower ever constructed, and it has to be because this one doesn't just hold the rocket steady as it prepares for launch, the Mechazilla is a machine in itself that can lift both the booster and ship from the ground and stack them on the launch mount. One key characteristic of Starship is that the rocket needs to be kept vertical at all times. If you tipped it over on one side, the body would crumble under its own weight. So in the past, this meant that a crane had to accompany each ship and booster to the launch mount for every stack and destack event. This can get very tricky when the Gulf Coast winds pick up, because you don't want a gigantic rocket swinging like a pendulum on a steel wire. 
Instead, the mechanized arms of the launch tower lift the rocket stages off of their transport vehicles and can hold them securely in any reasonable weather condition. These chopstick-like arms are powered by a hydraulic drawwork system that SpaceX took off of an oil rig. The company purchased two decommissioned oil drilling platforms with the idea of converting them into spaceports. That's not going to happen, but at least they gained something useful from the deal. The chopsticks have motorized capture rails on the inside of each arm. These interface with steel pins on the bodies of the rockets. This allows ground crews to fine-tune the rotation and front-to-back movement of each rocket to ensure precise integration. The launch tower has its own quick disconnect arm. This is the umbilical connection that provides fuel and pressurized gas to the upper stage of the rocket during launch prep. Eventually, someday in the not-so-distant future, these chopstick arms will also be called into service for an unprecedented maneuver. The thing about Starship and Super Heavy is that they are so incredibly large and massive that trying to integrate landing legs into the design that would be sturdy enough to support them would be totally impractical. The landing gear would introduce so much extra complexity and weight to the rocket that it just wouldn't be able to serve the purpose it is intended for. Landing the ship stage on a place like the Moon or Mars is more practical because we are talking about significantly lower gravity environments than the Earth, so legs are not as much of an issue there. But when it comes to landing on the Earth, SpaceX needs a better way. This is where we get to the catch maneuver. Just like SpaceX offloaded the engine plumbing and start systems into the launch mount, they have also offloaded the landing gear into the tower. So when the ship and booster return from flight, they are coming straight back to the launch site. Now, before they get anywhere close to the ground, the engine's landing burn is going to shelve off the majority of the airspeed, so they're not coming in hot. The rocket is coming down relatively slowly and will gently settle into a hover right within reach of the Mechazilla, at which point the chopsticks close, the pins on the rocket hit the catch rails on the arms and shock absorbers cradle the remaining momentum and bring the rocket to a halt. In theory, this is genius. But in practice, we will just have to wait and see. One thing's for sure, excitement will be guaranteed. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.